Hey, Tracy, I'm super pumped that you're here with us on the Pursue Your Spark podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Heike. Thank you so much for having me. You know, it, um, I like pursuing spark, so this is an exciting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of sparks, what does it mean to you to stay healthy? Oh, wow. That, uh, that's such a great... Oh, what does it mean to me to stay healthy? I would say in addition to sort of rest, a diet that works for me, you know, I'm, I'm mostly plant-based these days. I mean, I do eat meat, but focus on plant-based. I just feel better um, for me. I'm just going to dive right in because I know your audience. Um, when I went through menopause, I really kind of had a big aversion to meat. It just didn't taste as good or sound as good. So I don't know if that was my body telling me I didn't need as much protein. So much more plant-based, um, and then also like my mental health, you know, I run a business, I got married in March for the first time at 58 and, you know, there are just some things I need to do to self-care. One of the big things I did this year to take care of my health was I stopped sleeping with my phone in my bedroom. So I charge my phone in the living room and, uh, it means I've read since I started doing that, I've read seven books. I've gone back to reading at night. I'm sleeping better. It was a huge change and it really made a big difference. So I always oh think God. of health as kind of holistic, right? Like what are all the parts that we do? Absolutely. And you did like just the, the right thing. Get distractions mm -hmm. away, focus on me, eating what my body is craving, getting more sleep and reading more books. Who doesn't love that? It, 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 it the switch I knew it was a problem I knew the scrolling at night was a problem and as bad as scrolling at night it was the first thing in the morning and it's sort of under this guise of I'm being efficient and I cut it out I fall asleep faster I've read some unbelievably beautiful books I went back to reading fiction again just gorgeous uh, I yeah so that that to me is sort of I think taking care of your health is really holistic yeah. What's one of your favorite books? Can you remember a title? I just finished a book. I'm a little late to the party called Manhattan Beach uh, by Jennifer Egan, which is this beautiful story of this young woman in post-depression, pre-World War II, who becomes one of the only female divers for the Navy. And it's sort of a love story and a reckoning of a relationship with her father and what it meant to be a young woman at that time. And I just gobbled it up, gobbled it up. I love it. Love it. This, there's so many great books out there. I love it. So let's dive into when we're thinking books, I think clutter. And <laughs> I have to share with you some uh, a funny, I think it's a funny story before we dive in. My first pod, uh, podcast episode that I recorded on the Pursue Your Spark podcast was called The Clutter Buster. Mm. And it was an episode, and the episode was about part of what we're talking about today, about letting go of things and, and having a lot of stuff and items in our basements or wherever, attics, wherever we store our things. But I thought having you on the show was just, it was just cute because after 200 episodes, we finally have an expert <laughs> in the clutter space. So oh, that's great. That's, a, that's funny. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, I think Declutter is really, I don't think, I know. I've been a professional declutterer for 17 years. I have a company. I have 10 people who work for me. We're, you know, beyond busy. And I think that clutter is really an issue in this country, you know, in the United States for sure. I think it's an issue that women deal with a lot because they are do the lion's share of keeping the house. So they're dealing with the stuff, they're dealing with other people's stuff, they're dealing with their partner's stuff or their husband's stuff or their kid's stuff or their aging parent's stuff. And so women really become kind of the conduit for this stuff. And a lot of my clients, you know, I'll get this, I get this phone call all the time. You know, I was referred to you, you know, I'm a woman in her 60s, I'm in my late 50s. I realize I'm the only one who knows where everything in the, is in this house. I'm the only one who knows... I, I have so much pressure on me that if something happened to me, how would my family, like I need to get a handle on the stuff so I can rest easier. So I really think that women in this phase in their life are having a reckoning. Do I need all this? 
I haven't used it. Why am I the keeper of this stuff? What do I want to be doing in this next chapter? What does it look like? And is my stuff helping me or is my stuff a burden? Yeah. How did you get into the declutter business, Tracy? It's an interesting story. I was a personal assistant for 10 years for t- to two different people. Um, and I loved it. It was always different and exciting. And I traveled the world with them and remodeled houses and just did everything. And then I started to get some calls from people that are like, oh, you're really organized. Can you come help me? You know, my grandma passed away and I need to clean out her garage or I have all this paperwork I need to go through. And so calls just started coming in and I loved it. I didn't even charge at first. I was just doing it. And I started charging a little bit. And then a friend of mine was like, I think you have a business. And I was like, what? No, I just help people. And he's like, yeah, that's called a business. Helping people is called a business. So I, in 2007, I made my little website and I have my little flip phone and we have been beyond busy ever since. It's amazing. Yeah. You're one of the premier declutter businesses and called, you're called Declutterfly in LA. How did you come up with that name? You know, I really, the idea of sort of making clutter fly away, like decluttering and making the clutter fly away and it just stuck. And it's been, though I did, I do always joke that I didn't, it was at the start when we didn't really, we we're just starting to have emails. So I never realized how many times I'd have to spell it on the phone. D as in dog, C as in cat, L as in Larry. <laughs> I know. Cause I, I was thinking of Mac fly when I thought about this or Shutterfly, And I thought it just, it just looks also cute when it's written with a little D and then capital C. So there you are. You have a big staff of how many people? Uh, I have 10 organizers that work for me. Wow. That's incredible. So we, you know, the services that we do decluttering and organizing, we come in and help people, you know, get their homes in shape, figure out what they need. We do garages. Um, We do a lot of moves. So we'll help people declutter, pack them, unpack them and organize it into their new house. We also specialize in senior downsizing. So we'll help someone move out of a lifelong home into a smaller residence. And then another big, big part of our business is we help families clean out houses after someone has passed away. So that's a big, um, that's a big, that's about a third of our business. So what do you do with the stuff? Ship it to different family members. Is there value? Not usually. There's not usually value people. I'm telling you. Um, And helping them just do the physical labor to get a house ready to sell or whatever needs to happen. This is a big problem. And um, I know how difficult that is because my ex-husband passed away, I think about five years ago, and my kids had to deal with their dad's stuff in the apartment. He had storage units. He had, I don't know, he had all his crap, literally. And he had bought beautiful couches and um, uh, a table and side tables. And we tried to sell that stuff. It was expensive stuff. Nobody wanted to give us a dime. Nobody so wants to give you took, a dime. My daughter took the table. We got the two side tables and the rest eventually we gave away basically for a nickel and a dime. We're just like, just take it, just take it. So we don't have to haul it away. Yep. And now look, if I could give anybody any advice from my years of doing this, buy furniture because you love it and use it. It is not an investment. It is a diminishing asset. You are not going to be able to sell it. Like I have this conversation seven times a week. Furniture is meant to be used, buy it because you love it, make the investment because you love it in your house and you will not be able to sell it. You just won't. Yeah, because people are also saying, oh, look, here's my grandma, great grandmother's China. And you're looking at it and you're going, "Eh?" (laughs) yeah, well, there's that. (laughs) Yeah, I also say this all the time. Just because something's old doesn't make it valuable. That's right. You, you know? said this. But also. use it. But here's the thing. If you love your great grandmother's china, if you love it, use it. Put it in the dishwasher. Use it. Like eat pizza on it. Eat a cookie with a cup of tea on it. Stop saving it. That, that's the thing that I see so many people that have all this beautiful stuff that they don't want to use because it's too special. I'm like, today is special. Today, just today. Tuesday, I love special. It. I love it. And we're also talking a little bit or tying your book, uh, Make Space for Happiness as well in our conversation today and using the cup of tea or whatever that is, the glass is happiness. Yes. 
100%. I did a little, I did a little post on my Instagram that was like, um, you know, just like exactly like you send me pictures of using your nice stuff. And people were like, just out on their porch, like I just took a little half a scone and a cup of coffee, or I'm just sitting here doing the crossword puzzle with my pretty china that I love so much. That's happiness. Look at it, use it, love it. This idea that we have all these beautiful things, and they're tucked away for the amorphous some special someday down the road. No, use it today. I cannot tell people how many houses I've cleaned out after someone's passed where there are wedding gifts that they've been married for 40 years that they never used and clothes never worn. You know, use it. If you're going to buy it, use it. Now, when you're thinking of, of so many houses have so much stuff, because I mm -hmm. always think it's to, to, to them or even myself, it's not clutter. It is stuff we value. Why do people tend to get so much stuff and, and keep, I don't want to say the word hoarding because hoarding is a different very dip, yeah. trail of thinking about keeping stuff. Okay. This is great. Let, I'm going to, I, I want to go back and I'm going to address a couple things and then I'm going to get there. So the first thing is to anybody listening who is concerned about hoarding, you're right. That is a, uh, that is a mental health issue. Hoarding disorder is an anxiety disorder. There's a lot of help about that out there for it. But if it's something that you're worried that you have or someone you love has, get professional help, first of all. It's not casual. So there's that. Second of all, I want to say what how I describe, like this is how I define clutter, right? I define clutter in as the stuff in your home that gets in the way of what you want to be doing. So for example, let's say you want to eat dinner at your dining room table, but it's piled high with books to return to the library and a sweater and a this and some laundry and that. That's clutter because you can't use your dining room table to eat dinner on. So it doesn't, clutter doesn't necessarily have to do with the volume of stuff that you have. It's that when stuff is getting in the way of your house running smoothly. That's the day. So if you can't park your car in your garage, but you have, you know, you have it. I have plenty of people who are like, we're never going to park our car in the garage. We live in California. We want to use it for storage. We put shelves in there. That's not clutter to me. If it's organized, you know, it's in there. Great. But if your garage is so full that you can't even pull a car in, that's when it becomes clutter. So that's the distinction to people. It's not the amount that you have. Like I don't have very much. It's just the way I live and the way I've lived for a long time. But if I go into somebody's house who has, much, you know, three kids and, the, you know, more stuff, that's not, doesn't necessarily equate that it's clutter. But if they have rooms in their house that they can't go into, that they can't use, they have a guest room that's just a dumping ground, then it becomes clutter. So I think it's helpful for people to understand the distinction. I think so, because I, as a coach, before I started pursue your spark and, and my uh, brick and mortar studio, I would go to people's houses to train them in their fitness room. And boy, did I see some fitness rooms and they were literally stuffed with equipment and things and, and there was no room for anything. And some of the things were like, like treadmill seems to be a very popular uh, deposit for <laughs> jackets and clothes. Oh, I, I can, that's my favorite joke. I had a client say to me one time, they had this giant treadmill like in the middle of their bedroom. And I was like, do you use this? And she goes, every day to hang my clothes on. <laughs> you know, and you know, in the fitness world, like it's like, you don't need a treadmill. You have tennis shoes, take a walk. Like there's, you don't need all the equipment. And, you know, people keep buying all like, oh, if I just buy the right piece of equipment, then I'll start working out. No, no, no. You'll start working out, and then if you need equipment, you get it. But maybe you don't even need the equipment. You know what's fantastic? Push-ups. Push-ups are go. great. Yep. You don't need any equipment. Body weight. Get you, like Push-ups are a fantastic thing that add no clutter to your life. Okay, so listen, ladies, and maybe some gentlemen who are also listening to the podcast, push-ups. There's another person, aside from Heike, who likes push-ups. Who would oh. know? Tracy loves push-ups. You guys keep telling me you hate push-ups. <laughs> oh, 
I don't understand. Push-ups are the most, for me, they're the most efficient, right? You do them. Like if you, like if you do not, I mean, if you do nothing else, do 10 or 25 push-ups a day. Like you don't need anything. You can do them anywhere. You don't even have to put workout clothes on. You can just get bang out some push-ups. They work your core. I don't understand. I love push-ups. I love them. I'm with you. There you hear it from Tracy's mouth right there. <laughs> so no more excuses. <laughs> so as you're going into these people's homes and you start to de the decluttering process, um, how do people react? What's their emotional journey if you ask them to let go of things? What's happening with their psyche. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I see a lot of shame. I see a lot of regret. Oh, I spent that money. I never used that thing. You know, people are so quick to beat themselves up. Oh, I mean, you know, you've heard that. I should have never eaten that cookie. I can't believe I ate that cookie, you know? And so I, I always start from the place of like, let's not beat ourselves up for where we are today. Let's acknowledge that we want to make a change and how can we do things differently? So it's really a lot of shame, a lot of shame and embarrassment. How did I let my house get like this? You know, I, I used to be so organized. I hear that one a lot, especially from women, you know, before I had kids, I was so organized. And you're like, yeah. And then you had children like, <laughs> you know, what, you know, now you're taking care of a partner and a husband and aging parents and all that. So I think yeah. that if people are starting on their decluttering journey to understand that you're not alone, that a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people are dealing with this. And also to understand, and this is one of the things that I do a deep dive in, the, in my book, Make Space for Happiness, is that we are being marketed to, to buy all the time all the time. We're being told to buy. We need more. This will solve our problem. We need this eye cream. We need this, this, we need that. So, so there are, there are forces transpiring against you to get more stuff. I mean, we're right in the middle of the worst time of year for it, you know, buy, 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 buy. So understand the people can understand that. Um, let me go backwards. We are hardwired as humans to be hunters and gatherers, right? We are hardwired that when we were living on the tundra or the Serengeti or wherever we were on the Great Plains, when you saw an apple tree or a pear tree and you got fruit from it, you got a giant hit of dopamine. Like this is, you got rewarded for that fruit. The problem is we haven't evolved out of that. So when you go to Target now and you buy something, you get the same hit of dopamine as if you'd like killed a woolly mammoth for your family. So you have to understand, you know, you can't talk about decluttering if you're not looking at your acquisition cycle, right? Like what were you doing when you were in Target? What regret do you have? And I really, I really liken a lot of shopping to our relationship with food. You know, it's like, I have a sweet tooth. I love a Hershey's kiss. I feel terrible if I eat 15 of them. I feel terrible. Two, I got a little taste. I feel great. I actually move on from it. So it's the same thing with buying stuff, right? Like it, it, it's that dopamine hit and then we're chasing it and we're chasing it. And that's what leads to the clutter because you're like, well, I felt good when I bought this one thing. So if I buy 10 more, I'm going to feel 10 times better. It's not how it works. Or I always think about it. I get the first version of it because because I can afford it. But now I need a better version of what I already had because that's probably definitely better than the first one. And so I have to have it. Although version number one still works perfectly of whatever it is, whether it's a but sweater. You're being, but Heike, you're being told that you need the better version. The marketing is telling you, you need the better version. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know, and, and I think, uh, you know, I, I, this is a big soapbox of mine, you know, let's break down the conversation about anti-aging, right? Let's talk about that. Okay. Well, what, if you're truly anti-aging, you're dead. Like that's truly anti-aging. Like, no, I want to age. I want to live every day. I want to, you know, so this idea that we're like fighting all these things to, to anti-age instead of aging healthily or, you know, aging gracefully or embracing our aging and doing all that we can. And, you know, 
I mean, back to the push-ups, you know, like getting my core strength back. I'm, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, my balance is a little different than it used to be. You start to notice those things. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, remember that we're being marketed to all the time and telling us that we need the better thing or the new thing, and it's going to fix all our problems. Yep. Yep. And that's, I think, where a lot of women get caught because we're trying to be better. We are in our second half of life. We want to do things differently. But when we're looking at marketing just as an overall umbrella, we're not going anywhere better because, like you just said, we're too old, we're too wrinkly, we're too fat, we're not wearing the right clothes, we're not hip enough, we don't have the, the good haircut, we should do this and that and the other. And so it is, I think, emotionally, I know it is emotionally very challenging for so many women that I work with and I come across in, in, in our programs that they have self-doubt, they have, uh, they feel shame in that sense as well, that they can't accomplish, that I can't stick to my my diet routine or I can cannot um, exercise consistently. And they feel that shame around that. And, is, and it's not from, it's not getting any better from the social media that we are bombarded with. And so you're putting your phone out of your bedroom is a great start to get away from that being bombarded with more is better. Exactly. And it's uh, that same messaging is applies to stuff. If you just had the right blouse, if you just had the right pair of shoes, if you just had the right foundation piece, you're going to be better. You're, you know, I, I say this and I talk about this in the book, Make Space for Happiness, that self-confidence doesn't come from the things that you own. Self-respect doesn't come from the things that you own. You know what? Self-confidence and self-respect come from being of service, helping other people, doing good in the world, finding a cause that you believe in and trying to affect a change, you know, taking your neighbor who's elderly's trash cans out for them because they can't do it anymore. That's the stuff that builds self-confidence. And, you know, I just see so many women in, I mean, my I'm 58, so in, in my age, older, like, just with so much to so much knowledge and so much to offer. And I just, I mean, I think it's starting to happen that this conversation is changing where it's like, no, 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 don't put us out to pasture. We actually, you know, we have a lot, we, we have a lot to offer and we also don't care as much. So you're not going to hurt our feelings. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you're like, great. Good. I've heard it all come at me, you know? So seeing, and, and that's what I see with a lot of my clients too, is that they get to this point in their life and they're like, I don't want to deal with my stuff anymore. Like, I want to like, let it all go. I want to travel. I want to visit the grandparents. I have aging grandkids. I have aging parents. I need to take care of like, I don't want to be burdened by the stuff. I could walk away from it all. Mm -hmm. I always tell people if they're starting to feel that way, think about how you feel when you go on vacation, you go on a trip for three weeks with one suitcase. You don't miss anything you have at home ever. You know, you're not like, oh, I wish I had those four more pairs of shoes. No, you're happy your suitcase is light and you can walk along the cobblestone. So I, I think that this is such a good time in people's life um, to change their relationship to their stuff. Yeah. Now, Tracy, what are your seven clutter magnets you talk about? Yes. Yeah, so these I do a deep dive on in the book, Make Space for Happiness. Basically, the way that I describe these is... Um, I was like, think of ourselves as a, like, we're a whole person. And then we have this piece of ourselves missing, almost like a puzzle piece. So it's like, we feel like love is missing out of our life or self-confidence or self-respect or free time or knowledge, lasting knowledge. And that we think that we're going to buy something that's going to plug that, right. That we're gonna, I see this all the time. This is my, um, I see this all the time from grandparents, those of you that are listening that's starting to be grandparents, that feel like to get their, their grandkids love, they need to buy all these presents for them, right? They need to show up with a suitcase of presents and, and, and get the exact toy that they want, right? That that's going to make the love come. But really, when I think back to my, I was very close to my grandmother. When I think back, I don't, I think I don't remember a single present she ever bought me, 
but I remember working in the garden with her. I remember her teaching me her recipes. I remember a cup of tea, you know, so that these grandparents are looking for love from their grandkids with this stuff, but really it's about the experiences and the exchange and the stories. So what these clutter magnets are, they're things that we think we can fix inside of ourselves by buying stuff. And what I propose in the book is that the stuff's not going to fix it. The stuff's not going to fill that hole. So work on filling that hole in many different ways. And then the stuff, eh, if you want, you if you still want it, great. But usually you don't. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Because it is, we don't need to fill. And did you use a great example with the toys for the grandkids? My granddaughter, who's going to be too soon, her birthday comes and we bought her one present because she lives with her parents, not by herself, but with her parents in <laughs> Amsterdam. And uh, so I got her some Legos. I'm like, oh, this is practical. You know, this is something you can build. You can learn from doing Legos. And that's all. And I said, I don't want to give her stuff. And I want to get the experience that, like you said, uh, that they remember that her grandparents, her Oma and her Opa went to the playground with her and the, that we had to go up and down the slide five million times with her. It was just, I was thinking, oh my God, will my knees hold up? <laughs> yeah, you're right. That that's the experience that you want to, that's what you want her to remember. Maybe that there's a family recipe as she gets a little older. This is something my oh my used to make for me. And that, that kind of tradition, it's not, you know, I have, a, a very, I have two nieces and a nephew and I'm very close to them. And I noticed I would go to visit them and I would always bring gifts and, you know, just fun stuff. And they started like, whenever I'd walk in, they just pounce on my suitcase, like not even say hello. And I was like, oh, this is not, this is, I'm setting a bad deal up here. So the last couple of times I went, I just didn't bring anything. And then it was great. Then it was, we chatted and they told me their days and they showed me their art. And you know, that, that the stuff does not make the relationship. The no. stuff does not make the relationship. Yeah. So as you, as we were talking about getting a little bit away from the kids and to our aging parents, because a lot of us, mm -hmm. and I'm 62, my parents are in their eighties and uh, you're looking into downsizing, moving them perhaps into a care facility or assisted living, depending on, on their status. What advice would you give somebody like me who's in that uh, shoes to say, what, what would I do? How would I go about their yeah. stuff? Because they're they're emotionally so invested in the things that we've talked about already. You know, I think that the, the advice that I always give people is as soon as you can start decluttering with them, the better. You know, it's really it, it, waiting until you have to move them, waiting until you're trying to find a place and doing it all at once. It's so traumatic for everybody. So it's like, if you can with your parents, maybe give them a couple after, you know, if you live close by, like give them a couple afternoons a month, like let's tackle this cupboard. Let's, you know, because what happens is even though they're attached to their stuff, which is true, but another big component of it is that for a lot of um, older people, they can't do what they used to be able to do physically. And they feel bad about that. So they don't want to ask for the help. Like, oh, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. But instead of saying like, let's tackle this linen closet. I know you have some old sheets in here. We're going to take them. The ones you don't want, we're going to take them to the animal shelter and donate them. Like what are, you know, just gently start to declutter. And also another thing to remember with the aging brain is that less stuff is better, right? Like I, I get calls from people all the time who are dealing with neurological issues. And every neurologist is like, less stuff, less stuff, clutter, clutter, physical clutter, clutters up your brain. So if people are aging, you want them to be able to be safe in their house, right? That there's not things on the floor, they're not going to trip and that they don't have, I mean, I, I, I see this all the time. It's such a funny example, but I'll go into someone's house and they'll be like, I can't find my car keys. I can't find my house keys. And they'll have like hundreds of keys from the last 50 years. And I'm like, okay, these all need to go in the metal recycling. They're like, I might need it. I'm like, you don't even know what this is from. You don't need all these keys. You need three keys, right? So if you are dealing with aging parents, as soon as you can start decluttering with them, the better the process is going to go. Do not wait until it's a fire drill. Do not wait until the moving trucks are coming. Um, you know, really, really 
um, start small. Uh, can you share a transformative story from your career of all those years of decluttering where the decluttering process dramatically changed someone's life? Oh. You said, oh my God. <laughs> you know, I had, yeah, I had a lovely young woman who called me and um, she and her, her parents had passed very suddenly and super close together and had left a mess. Like a, just a mess. Their house had been a mess. Her father's business was a mess. Her and her brother had been dealing with it. There were storage units. They were spending all this money. And she could, she really wanted, she'd been offered a new job in a different place. She really felt like, you know, she was, she wanted a fresh start. She was super, but she was like, I can't even think about making, I can't even do this because of all this stuff, these storage units and the, you know, all this. And we, went through, I think we went through five storage units of her parents' stuff. We went through her apartment, her garage, like all this stuff. Cause when her parents passed, they didn't know what to do with it. And she was finally to a place like when we got through the process, she was like, I can now see my own future. I can see what my future looks like. I have a clear path to make a decision that's best for me. That before this path had been clouded with old hospital beds and records and you know and all of a sudden it was like it just cleared a path and that's what I see the most in terms of transformation is that the path gets cleared mm, I can totally see that when I think of the the storage units and the, like my mom is hanging on to all kinds of things as well that she doesn't want to give away and you know a cupboard full of glasses that nobody ever drinks out of ever and they're just yep. there to fill the cupboard um, yeah and no. it's hard. I think it's hard. You know, I think that when you're dealing with aging parents and that too, that you have to remember, you know, that this is about mortality for them, right? Mm -hmm. That they're, I, I just moved a client, um, I had moved, she had a big house and her husband had passed and we moved her into a very pretty little condominium. And now she's at the point where we had to move her into assisted living. So I've done, this will be my third move I've done with her. And she's become a very dear friend. And, and weirdly, the move after her husband passed into the condo was easier than this move because she, and rightly so, she's like, this is the last move I'm ever going to do. This is it, you know? And so we talked about it and her kids were very involved. And, but I think to not shy away from yeah, this is, you're heading into your last chapter. Let's make the most of it. But acknowledge that that's part of what the, because it's not the stuff. It's that they're like, oh, I'm never going to host Christmas again, or I'm never going to host Passover again, or, you know, that this, I always say about aging, and someone had said it to me, I said, it's not that I can't believe I'm at this age. It's that it happened so fast. Like, yeah. it's so fast. You know, and so I think when someone's looking at moving, you know, aging parents are looking in to make that move. There's a lot of that stuff that comes up. So don't be afraid to discuss it. Don't be afraid to discuss it. My niece called me. She went to visit my mom. She's my niece is 23. She called me up. She spent the weekend with my mom, her grandma. And she called me up crying. She's like, is Nana dying? Is Nana dying? And I was like, well, kind of. I mean, we're all dying every day. But what do you mean? She's like, she just kept giving me stuff, like telling me to take stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, she's decluttering. <laughs> I was like, I don't think Nana's dying right now, but she's getting, yeah. And I was like, did you take it? And she goes, yes. And I was like, good. <laughs> Get it out of the house. <laughs> you can tell her that my mom did the same thing with me the last time I visited her. She went into a jewelry box and anything that's kind of a jewelry, she would just, here, take it, take it. And at first I was like, no, 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 I, uh, I don't really take need it. this. Maybe you can pawn it somewhere. And my husband said, take it. Take yep. it. Just don't say anything. Just take take it. it. Take it. I had this this other client that I just moved. Her grandkids came. They were home for the holidays for um, from college, and I call and I know both of them. And I called them up and I said, "You're going to go by your grandma's house, and she's going to give you things, and you're going to take them. And I don't care if you drive them straight to the Goodwill and drop them off. You're going to smile and say thank you and get them out of the house for her." And they're like, "Okay, okay." <laughs> yep, I think that's that's a, the easiest way to approach it. Just be done with it. Just because they just want to know it goes somewhere, right? They just want to know it goes somewhere. And so I think that, um, and I would also say to people who are looking at downsizing a parent, you know, if you, you may need help, 
right? You may need a professional organizer. You may need to hire somebody. Like it's very difficult for families to help families and all sorts of old trauma and old things come up. So, you know, if you're facing this and you may want to look into getting an extra set of hands, oftentimes it makes it a little bit easier. Easier. Yeah. How do you see decluttering interacting with other parts of our lifestyle, like our exercise and diet and specifically for us oh. women in midlife? So this is fascinating. And I believe it was at Harvard. I'm going to get, I'm not going to get the university right, but there was a study done where they put people in a cluttered kitchen, like a very, very, very cluttered kitchen. And they offered them a snack. They offered them the choice between a cookie and a carrot. And overwhelmingly the people in the cluttered kitchen took the cookie. Then they reversed the experiment and they put people in an uncluttered kitchen and they offered them the same cookie snack or carrot snack. Overwhelmingly in the uncluttered kitchen, they took the carrot. So de let's just start with decluttering in a kitchen. If your kitchen is cluttered, if it's not easy for you to prepare food for yourself, your default is you're gonna order in, you're gonna go through the drive-through, you're not able to nourish yourself if you can't, if your counters aren't clean, if your dishes aren't put away, your home is a tool. Your kitchen is a tool to nourish you, right? It's to cook delicious food that nourishes you. And if your kitchen is cluttered, if you have cupboards full of expired food and old spices with no flavor, you're not going to want to cook and you're going to default to cooking unhealthy food. So there's a direct correlation between how you nourish yourself and the state of your kitchen. And then let's talk about, this is a big one too, closet full of clothes you can't fit into anymore. If you have a closet full of clothes you can't fit into, every time you open your closet, you're just making yourself feel better. And I, I mean, you can probably speak to this better than I can. I am in a pause with like, I went to my gynecologist and I'm like, I can't believe how much weight I put on. And she was like, opened my chart. I've been seeing her for 10 years. And it was like the exact same number. And it just had redistributed, just had gone other places, yep. you know? And it's like, my body's different. There's gravity. My boobs are different. Like, it's just different. And there's no, you know, and I work out to feel healthy and strong, but I'm not going to get back to a 22-year-old body. It's just not going to happen. And so if you have a closet of clothes that you used to fit into, every time you open that closet, you're telling yourself that your best days are behind you. You're telling yourself that you failed because you've lived up, walked this earth for 60 years and gravity has affected you. That is not, gravity is not a failure. That's not a failure. So I'm a big proponent of do not have clothes in your closet that you can't wear. Don't do it. Don't do it. It just makes you feel bad. It just makes you feel bad. It's just like, if guys, when you watch the video, if you watch the video, you see my hands shaking, going for the applause, the silent applause that we <laughs> went on Zoom about this, because it's so true. The old clothes that we are attached to is the past. We're no longer the past. And we're, we're talking about the actions that we can take now that bring us forward. And it's also, uh, we, we're laying out a roadmap, as we talk about in the Pursue Your Spark courses, that we're laying out a roadmap for a healthier, stronger, more confident you, which starts or continues on into your closet as well. So we Always. don't need Let that me, stuff. I want to tell you, people appreciate the story. So I, I think I said at the beginning of the podcast, I got married for the first time at 58 in March. Yeah, I know. It's great. Just, uh, he's lovely, just lovely, lovely, lovely. So I had this idea. So when my brother got married 17 years ago, I was his best sister. I stood up with him as of his best man. And I had this beautiful blue, beautiful blue dress. Um, and I loved it and I saved it. So I had an idea for my wedding that my 23 year old niece, who's his daughter, would wear my dress that I wore to her dad and stepmom's wedding. And that the little niece would wear the flower girl dress that her older sister had worn. So we both, we had these two dresses. And I went to put it, I, I was like, well, let me just try it on one last time. You know, the dress I'd worn 17 years ago. And it, it was the first time I'd noticed this, but basically 
my rib cage has changed. My rib cage has expanded. It's not that. It's my my ribs are different. So I couldn't zip the dress up. Everything else felt I could I was like, I'd have to break a rib to do this. And I had a moment where I was like, I can't, you know, and then I was like, wait, what are you doing? Like you're getting married to the love of your life and you can't wear a dress. And my niece wore it and she looked like a movie star. Like to see my niece in that dress and to see my little niece in the other dress and like just I was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It was the greatest day of my life. And everyone looked so happy and beautiful. And I was so, you know, but it was like that, the change of my, there's nothing I could do about that. That's just life. It's life. Yeah. <laughs> it's like usually after kids, you have a bigger rib cage, a bigger, bigger hips, and suddenly your feet start growing and your ears, who knew? <laughs> exactly who who knows mm -hmm. so I think that you know to circle back to this point to people like don't leave clothes in your closet that make you feel bad you there's I, enough to feel bad there's enough to feel bad don't don't do it wear keep clothes in your closet that you wear and that you love and that you feel good in and that may be a different size mm -hmm. and also I want to point this out this was a big revelation to me when I went shopping for my wedding dress and some outfits for some of the events. I bought things. So I bought, I think, three or four outfits. I'm not exaggerating. Everything, different designers, I bought everything from the, a size two to a size 12. Some things were a two, some were a four, some were an eight, some were a 12. Sizes don't mean anything. They're all made up. So if you're beating yourself over a number on a tag, don't do it. Amen to that. Yeah. Because they're also manufactured differently and everybody has a different idea of what their brand size is. Just, yeah, no, no. But let's pivot a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about your one kid, one world. Oh, pause. yeah. I definitely want to bring that. Tell the listeners a little bit more about it because you're the co-executive director of One Kid, One World. Yeah, so we are a nonprofit based, we're, we're based in the United States, but we work exclusively in Kenya and Central America. And basically what we do is we identify schools that are struggling to stay open. So we don't ever build a school from the ground up. We go in partnership with a community that says we have students, we, we need a school here, we've got this school, and then we get them what they need to keep their doors open. So we pay teacher salaries, we build classrooms, we put desks, books. We don't affect curriculum in any way, but we um, we offer, you know, a place for an education. Dormitories, we put solar power in. I think we've done, we've rebuilt 13 schools in Kenya and maybe 25 or 30 in Central America. And our big new project, which I am unbelievably excited about, is um, we have opened a micro plant. So it's a small manufacturing plant in Kenya, sort of in the little town that's the center of four of our girls' schools. And we are manufacturing maxi pads, feminine hygiene, um, because period poverty and access to feminine hygiene care is one of the biggest things that keeps girls out of school. So for, so we the women who are working in our plant are all graduates from the schools that we've been supporting. And our goal, our commitment to the community that as long as the girls are attending school in one of the seven schools that we support, they will have free access to feminine hygiene for their whole education. Nice. Nice. I think that's such a notable cause. And I definitely wanted to hear the listeners hear about it and we're putting links in the show notes so they can find yeah, out it's a great where... it's a great one ending period poverty is just really you know it's just something that speaks to me um just you know when you when i found out that on average a young woman in kenya misses two months of school a year because she doesn't have access to feminine care not acceptable not acceptable. not acceptable, not acceptable. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's great. If anybody wants to come, we do trips once a year. 
<laughs> hey, you you will have the links in the show notes. So how how can people uh, reach you, Tracy? And how can get how can they get your book, the Make Space for Happiness yes. to be happier and less cluttered? Yes, yep. Make Space for Happiness. So book is available all places, bookshop.org, Amazon. It's in almost every public library in the United States. So if you're trying not to buy books, public library, it's also Audible. Um, if you have an Audible account, it's free, which is fantastic. Um, my biggest platform is Instagram. I'm at, at Tracy underscore McCubbin. We do lots of super fun things over there. And then um, TracyMcCubbin.com. I've got a newsletter every once in a while, not too much, and you know, lots of fun things. But Instagram is my biggest platform. That's where... We have a lot of fun. Awesome. It's true because I stalked you a little bit on Instagram and see <laughs> who you are. Who is this Tracy McCuffin that's going to be on our show and shares all this goodness about decluttering space and happiness for women in midlife? Thank you so much for being here, Tracy. It was a pleasure. And thanks for all the knowledge. Thank you for having me. And you have a great day. Thank you.